The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes The Case of the Elephant Man By Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Nora Godwin Narrated by Peter Silverleaf In the early summer of 1886, we had a surprisingly unannounced visitor at Baker Street. My colleague, Dr. Frederick Treves, a surgeon at London Hospital, stood quite early in the morning, might I add, in front of our door and wished to talk to us about an important matter that I had dealt with, at least in medical terms, before. I reminded Holmes that in November, a year and a half ago, I was called in by Dr. Treves when he was dealing with a prominent case of elephantiasis. Joseph Merrick, horribly disfigured by bone deformations all over his body and especially on his head, had appeared at Treves for in-depth examinations. Just across Whitechapel Road 123, the poor guy was presented as a monstrous attraction in a small show stall. He was described as an elephant man. They had invented an utterly outlandish story of his background about his mother's alleged accident with an elephant. We knew, of course, that this was complete nonsense. The deformations affecting the head, torso and extremities, with the exception of the left hand, were either due to a mutation or to a rare disease that was mostly known only in Asia. Dr. Treves, in my presence and cooperation, finally presented the case at a meeting of the Society of Pathology in Bloomsbury. But the deplorable Mr. Merrick, who was presented unclothed to the assembled medical staff for the occasion, felt so uncomfortable that he then refused further examination and treatment. Instead, he was rather going back to being displayed to the paying audience as an attraction. But soon after, the establishment of London exhibitor Tom Norman was closed by the authorities, and I lost his track. But ever since he again was treated by Dr. Treves, I was able to learn more about his whereabouts after the closing of the circus. Mr. Berwick was completely penniless and without any means at the time, between the age of twenty-three, twenty-four years, my colleague said. His loving mother had long since died, his heartless father had rejected him, and normal work was impossible because of his defamations. So, at the turn of 1884-1885, he sought out the circle of entrepreneurs who had already successfully marketed him as a fairground attraction in his hometown of Leicester and Nottingham, and so Mr. Merrick found a new engagement in the circus of Sam Roper, who incorporated him into his freak show. A highly unworthy situation for a human being, I interjected. No matter how disfigured he is, you must know that, Holmes. Mr. Merrick's outward appearance was probably that of a monster, but his inner nature was that of a child. Nevertheless, this person has feelings and needs love and acceptance like everyone else. Quite right, Dr. Treves confirmed. We are dealing with a thinking, emotionally capable person. It is, however, to be attested that this is precisely why such displays are no longer welcome in English society. Fortunately, it is increasingly frowned upon to use the misfortune of others for your own profit and sensationalism, and that's why Roper finally had to pass on Mr. Merrick to a showman named Ferrari, who was tinkering across the European continent with his show. And that's what my patient must have done last year on a tour through Europe. Holmes had listened carefully and said, I suppose such a tour being very exhausting was not exactly helpful to Mr. Merrick's health. However, I do not see yet to what extent this matter falls within my area of expertise. Mr. Merrick is a free man and makes his own decisions. Uh, just a second, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Trees replied. 
I'll get to the point right away. Yesterday, Mr. Merrick was picked up by the police at Liverpool Street Station in London. Beyond his fundamentally awful appearance, he seemed clearly neglected, confused and barely responsive. He was not able to communicate with the officials. All he carried with him was my business card, so the police brought him to my hospital. Of course I recognized my former patient immediately. We took care of him, put him in a bed, and treated his bronchitis. By giving him proper food and care, we are hoping he will regain his strength. Holmes nodded. I understand, he said. As a detective, I guess you want me to ask you how your patient got into this situation, right? Probably, Treve said, smiling. This morning, for the first time, Mr. Merrick was able to speak again. That is, within his usual abilities. It takes a little experience to understand him completely, which is also a result of the disease. In any case, Mr. Merrick was able to tell me that he had made an arduous journey from Brussels. On the last day of his circus's stay, he had been assaulted and robbed in the city, suffering a head wound. When he woke up again, he was disorientated at first, then he went to the station, but he had missed the departure of his troop. So he was completely alone, seemingly abandoned, in the middle of Belgium, and you can imagine that hardly anyone was willing to help the monster, which would only speak English and could hardly be understood at that. In the end, Flemish farmers felt bad for him and let him ride on their horse carts towards Antwerp. There, two Welsh sailors smuggled him on board and took him to Harwich, Sussex, as a blind passenger. From there, Merrick made it by train to London, where he was reportedly found by the police and taken to me. What an adventurous story, Holmes said. It seems that fate has already tested the poor man enough. But now, Dr. Treves, I ask myself whether you really want to engage us in the investigation of a simple street robbery. The perpetrator or perpetrators are probably simple Belgian crooks who will hardly be found. How much money was taken from him? Mr. Merrick's total earnings, my colleague replied. That was fifty pounds, which is a very large sum for him. Holmes began to think, but I answered before he could. We are so sorry, I said firmly, but we cannot investigate in this case. We are not able to travel to Brussels. We are probably being sought by the police there. If they find us, we will have to go to jail for several years. Treves laughed briefly. Police? Wanted? Jailed? he asked amusedly. How? Well, we were, I stuttered. We were there, the government's orders, top secret. There was essentially a misunderstanding, Holmes interrupted me in time. Just a misunderstanding. But Watson is right. We cannot go to Brussels for the time being. And I also have some doubts as to whether it would be worth all the trouble. But Dr. Treves had a good argument. Uh, there will be no need to travel to the continent, he said. Mr. Merrick has few memories of the attack because he was immediately struck from behind. But when he lay half unconscious in the street, he heard a voice. It said in English. You can stay here. We don't need you in London. Holmes perked his ears. It can therefore be safely assumed that the perpetrator knew Mr. Merrick, he said. Was he able to relate the voice? Dr. Treves shook his head. Unfortunately, no. He said the voice was undoubtedly male, but other than that he could not make out anything else. In any case, Holmes continued his thought, we can assume that the perpetrator is from the vicinity of Ferrari's fairground circus. Am I right in assuming that these people have been back here on the island for some time now? Indeed, my colleague confirmed. After the stop in Brussels, there was only a short stay in Bruges. After that, they went back home. This means that Ferrari has moved into his quarters with its attractions on the car yard in West Ham, but they are only there until next Sunday— and then they start a tour to Italy. And that is why swift action is needed. I would be forever in your debt, Mr. Holmes, if you could go there today and find out more. Well, 
There is still the issue, Holmes said, that the damage done is only fifty pounds. Treves nodded at first, but then replied, I am fully aware that this is below your usual fee, Mr. Holmes, but don't forget that to Mr. Merrick fifty pounds is a lot of money. As far as I am concerned, I do not count to be paid in this matter with traditional currency. So far, God did not mean all too well with Mr. Merrick, and I have taken on the duty to do everything possible to counteract this situation. I do what I am trained for and according to my profession. These are, of course, primarily medical measures, but also psychological. And one of them is the clarification of this common assault. The damage lies in my patient's head and heart. Society has done Mr. Merrick wrong on so many levels, and we should start making it right. Money doesn't matter. The police will, of course, do nothing, because they are not responsible for offences taking place abroad. I would therefore ask you to investigate in this case. Holmes walked up and down the room wordlessly while thinking. At least three minutes passed before he came back to us at the table and announced, All right, Dr. Treves. I, too, deeply dislike this infamous injustice, and I do not want to leave it unpunished. First of all, however, I have one condition. I want to meet Mr. Merrick. Together we went to the London Hospital, where the so-called Elephant Man was kept sealed off in a single room. I had not seen the patient since December 1884, and, to my regret, I found that his general condition had tended to deteriorate. Mr. Merrick sat on his bed in a bent posture, his back leaning against the wall. He was unable to lie on his back like an ordinary person, because the weight of his immensely deformed head would have hindered his airways or even broken his neck. However, even sitting in this position was painful to him due to his spinal curvature and a hunched back. His oversized extremities only caught the eye at second glance. The most striking, of course, were the deformities in his face. It was distorted with two large bulges, dents on the forehead, free of any symmetry, small eyes, a crooked mouth, apparently a monstrous face from hell, as if a nightmare of Bosch or Bruegel originated. The no less disfigured torso was covered by a wide nightgown. Joseph, exclaimed Dr. Treves as we entered three, you may remember my colleague Dr. Watson, and his companion is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, a local detective. We approached the bed and Mr. Merrick slowly lifted his heavy head. He seemed tired, and as far as one could interpret his frayed expression, a little surprised. He spoke slowly and indistinctly. Every word was noticeably hard to bring across his lips. I, kn I know who Mr. Holmes is, he stammered. I have read stories about his cases. So far, however, I wasn't sure if it wasn't just a fictional novel character. Holmes, who stayed calm even though Mr. Merrick's appearance was quite vile, grabbed his twitching left hand, which was the only visible part of his body that was not deformed. I am happy to meet you, Mr. Merrick, he said, and I can assure you that I am a real man of flesh and blood. I wish I could say this with similar confidence, said Mr. Merrick, who apparently tried to smile. Unfortunately, I really feel like that. I noticed that there was no mirror in this room. It only contained the necessities. To me it looked more like a prison cell than a hospital room. In a way it resembled our patient, since his having this illness must have felt to him like imprisonment. On the other hand, though, this room was also a safe retreat, where the supposed monster remained untroubled by mockery, intrusiveness and gaffes. I, too, shook Mr. Merrick's left hand and said, Great to see you again. How is the recovery from your odyssey going? Thank you for asking, Dr. Watson, Merrick replied. I think I am going to be fine. After all, my skull is massive and endures a lot. 
Now Dr. Treves intervened to cut to the point. Joseph, the two gentlemen are here to investigate the robbery. Do you think you are able to recapitulate the events and perhaps answer one or the other question? Mr. Merrick turned to Holmes and said, It's an honour that you want to investigate this crime, but I do not want to waste your time. You certainly have more important things to do. Investigating a crime is never a waste of time, I immediately interjected, and the most important case is always the current one, and right now that is yours. Holmes let me go through with these platitudes, especially since they were helping against Mr. Merrick's self-doubt. Our new client hesitated only briefly, and then began to tell us his side of the story. It was the last day of our stay in Brussels. In the evening, after the show was closed, I limped through the narrow streets of the old town, because I wanted to see at least a bit of Belgium. I wore a large coat with a hood pulled deep into my face so I could not cause a scene, but I felt like I was being followed all the time. Repeatedly I stopped and turned around, but I did not see anyone. I only noticed that my suspicion was correct when a powerful blow hit me from behind, here on the left of my head, where one would normally locate the cheekbone. A subsequent kick in the back brought me to the ground, on the smooth cobblestones. I heard the voice saying that I wouldn't go back to London. Then I lost consciousness. It must have been a long time before I came back to my senses. Obviously not a single passerby had tried to help me. I got back up to reach our train to Bruges, but I was too late. I also noticed that all my money had been taken from me. How I got back here, Dr. Treves has probably already told you. Unfortunately, that's all I can remember. I was again impressed by Mr. Merrick's eloquence. Behind the facade of the monster was not only a sensitive, but also an intelligent and attentive person. Holmes briefly sorted out his statement and then said, Based on your description, we can draw several conclusions. The perpetrator was British, male, reasonably strong, known to you, and left-handed. Left-handed, Dr. Trees repeated incredulously. Certainly, Holmes replied. He stood behind my back and put his right hand to my right temples to indicate a blow, and of course this would have hit me on the right. You see, said Holmes, if Mr. Merrick was hit in the head from the back left, the attack was also carried out with his left fist. Once again, Holmes demonstrated this movement, uh, this time he actually beat me lightly against the temples. Do you mind? I protested. Oh, sorry, Holmes replied, apparently a little amused. I am a little clumsy with my left hand. It's all right, I said. I think your spectacle has been successful. So the perpetrator is left-handed. Me too, Mr. Merrick muttered. Well, inevitably. Holmes had to smile at the fact that the deplorable guy even had humour and self-irony, otherwise he probably wouldn't have endured his fate. Well, we'll see if this information can help us, Holmes said. But for now, Mr. Merrick, we should be worried about possible enemies. Was there a dispute within the circus staff? Cases of fraud, greed, jealousy? No, no, Mr. Merrick replied. The people I've been dealing with form a community, the community of freaks. We share our destiny and everything else. We have no other friends or contacts to the outside world. We were like family. Holmes raised an eyebrow. A family, he repeated. Of course, Merrick continued. Our biological families have rejected us, most of them immediately after birth, in my case, it was at the age of twelve, after the death of my benevolent mother. We don't have anything else. I understand, Holmes said. And did you have a particularly close relationship with anyone? Bertram and Harry were my best friends, Merrick said. Bertram Dooley and Harry Bramley. Could they have anything to do with the crime? asked Holmes. Merrick started to roar. Apparently he had to laugh, but couldn't. 
Then he said, Apart from our friendship, they wouldn't be physically able to do that. They're not three and a half feet tall. Uh, so they're small scale, Holmes said. Yes, Merrick confirmed. They are dwarves, Lilliputians. And what about Mr. Ferrari? continued Holmes. He probably does not belong to the community of freaks, but he is the director of the Enterprise. What was your relationship with him? It was all right, Mr. Merrick said quickly. Giovanni, or Joe, as we call him, is certainly not a saint, but a profit oriented businessman. But he has always treated us well. After all, we are also his capital. Without us, he wouldn't have a show, and the show has to keep going. Mr. Merrick's sober view of his world had something frightening, but it was arguably true. Nevertheless, I disliked the idea of making capital from the misfortune of others or by exploiting human beings. At the next moment, Reginald Tuckett, Dr. Treves's young assistant, appeared to usher us out. Dear colleagues, Mr. Holmes, he said in a demanding tone, our patient now needs some rest to be prepared for the following treatments. Of course, Holmes said, we're leaving. I think we have discussed everything that is necessary so far. Have a nice day, Mr. Merrick. Goodbye, our client replied. Thank you for wanting to do justice for a monster like me. In front of the hospital, a carriage of the Institute waited, which Dr. Treves had provided us with. He himself was now indispensable in the hospital, so we set off alone to the trailer park of Ferrari's circus. During the ride, I first tried to read the thoughts off of Holmes's face. Eventually, out of lack of success, I tried it in the traditional way. What do you think? I asked directly. Holmes was apparently pulled out of a kind of trance. Who, me? he said. But no one else was present. Oh, nothing, the usual, all the world and his wife. The answer cheered me up a little, and I replied, That's probably much more than nothing, not to say everything. Holmes did not respond. It took half a minute for him to continue. I don't usually care for running around fairs and fairgrounds too much. Nevertheless, I assume that more human monsters will await us there. Of course, I replied. This is Ferrari's business. Dwarves and giants, bearded virgins, Siamese twins, wolf people, heaven knows what else. It's strange, Holmes continued. These people are creatures of God, aren't they? I had to think and came to the thoughtless statement, Well, I don't think they were so intended in creation. And if so, said Holmes, if these people are part of providence and God's plan, this only allows one conclusion. I frowned demonstratively and asked, Which one? Well, God is a sadistic bastard, Holmes said, remarkably emotionless. How dare he expose his children to such a fate? What did Joseph Merrick, who was just five years old at the time, do that he had to be punished with such deformations? What was it for? I must confess that I had no answer to that with the best of intentions, but it was clear to me that Holmes had in fact questioned the existence of God himself with this line of thought. That is why I tried to explain it to him. We both know only too well, I began, that towards the end of the nineteenth century it is probably appropriate to seek the last answers not necessarily in this or that holy scripture, but with the help of science. From a scientific point of view, perhaps the theory of evolution gives us an insight. It should not be forgotten that evolutionary development means adaptation, but in a long methodical process of trial and error, unless caused by a specific illness or accident. Human disfigurements are sometimes based on mutations that have swirled the genetic material. In this sense, our elephant man is perhaps just an unfortunate attempt at a new diversion, maybe a dead end of evolution. Holmes had listened patiently to my remarks and remained silent until after their end. It was only after a few minutes that he said, You may be right, my dear Watson, 
but the way in which ordinary people deal with their respective deviations makes me doubt whether humanity itself is at an impasse. It despises any minor deviation from the norm, not only in physiognomy, but also in terms of ethnicity, religion, or way of life. It raises the bars of a supposed normality to an ideal that they can never reach, and demands standardizing society. The real malformations are in the minds of the ordinary, and our schools, churches, newspapers, and cultural institutions, as well as our politicians, promote them. The final imminent inner logic leads from social exclusion to extinction. No other species on our planet is prepared to exterminate members or entire groups of its own species to the same extent as we do. I finally had nothing to answer, and the profound feeling that Holmes had painted a bleak but possibly true picture of the supposed crown of creation and respectively evolutionary history. The impasse may be us. For the time being, however, we have been urged to move our investigation forward. When we arrived on the pitch of Ferrari's circus, it was buzzing. Everywhere between the cars, which served as a mobile accommodation, there was a lot of activity, since soon the next tour was about to take place. Clowns in full costume practiced juggling with balls. The black panthers in the rolling cage were fed by their dompteur with large pieces of meat. Muscle men were lifting weights. A chimpanzee in a sailor's suit had to learn tricks. And then there was an area in the wagon warehouse that stood in complete contrast to the colourful cheerfulness and conveyed grey tristesse. This was the department of the so-called freaks. We had to get through to Ferrari's office, as a friendly unicyclist had told us. The dark side of the circus was full of weird creatures who apparently vegetated rather indiscriminately. They didn't have to rehearse anything either, because they were the show themselves. We passed the table with two young ladies, who apparently gave in to their alcohol addiction. Only when we stepped closer could we see that they had grown together at the hip, spine and back. Following a pair of brothers from Southeast Asia, this type of double malformation was referred to as Siamese twins. One of the girls whistled at us flirtatiously as we walked by. I reacted with a friendly nod of my head. Next, we were met by a man who was missing his legs and abdomen. Whether due to an accident or a birth defect is unknown to me. He moved on a rollerboard, which he pushed with his arms, looking at us suspiciously, but did not say a word. Eventually, a dark-skinned African without upper extremities stepped out of a small tent to our right. He immediately smiled at us and asked if he could help us. We are looking for Mr. Ferrari's office, I said. We were told that this was the right way to go. Absolutely, replied the poor man. It's the red wagon right in that direction. And since he was not now able to show us the way with his hand, he raised one leg at hip height and showed us the way forward. We thanked each other and immediately reached the indicated place, where there was a slightly larger wagon, which was actually painted red. I knocked on the door and shouted, Mr. Ferrari! Avanti! answered a voice from inside, and Holmes told me to be the first to step in. He followed me immediately. The circus director's mobile office was comfortably furnished on the inside. Ferrari was sitting behind a small desk and had apparently been counting and writing down the earnings. A considerable pile of banknotes laid right in front of his nose. He himself was an older gentleman. He was balding with little hair on the front and top of his head. Despite his average height, Ferrari certainly weighed at least two hundred pounds and sweat was running down his forehead and from his armpits. What do you want? he asked as we stood in front of him, trying in vain to hide his Italian accent. My name is Dr. John Watson, I replied, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, a consultant detective from London. We are investigating one of your former employees, Mr. Joseph Merrick. 
Ferrari immediately said, Ah, the elephant man, has he reappeared? He was lost to us in Brussels. Did he do anything? Surely he will not have hurt anyone. Not at all, Holmes replied. Mr. Merrick is the victim, not the perpetrator, and yes, he has reappeared. Yesterday he was apprehended in London, and now he is in a hospital. So something happened to him, suggested Mr. Ferrari. Holmes nodded. Mr. Merrick was assaulted and beaten down. Uh, that is why he has fallen behind in Brussels. Didn't you wonder what happened to him when he wasn't at the train to Bruges? Honestly, Ferrari replied, it happens all the time that one of my show objects runs off. As soon as they have earned a little money, they lose it, spend it on alcohol, opium, and desperate maids. Otherwise, they have few life prospects. Uh, the business is fast-paced. I can't take care of everyone. We noted the disappearance of Mr. Merrick, but that's it. Uh, this is so wrong, I replied. Your show object, as you call it, could have used your help. Ferrari shrugged indifferently. I am not responsible for any wrongdoing and criminal activity. I am an entrepreneur, not a nanny or a policeman. Our train was already booked, and we had a show the next day in Bruges. Any delay would have been a financial loss. Time is money. Holmes threw a certain glance at the banknotes on his desk, and then looked at the director again. One can definitely tell. So you didn't see Mr. Merrick after the last performance in Brussels? No, certainly not, Ferrari replied. However, I don't maintain too much contact with the freaks, which they don't mind. They live in their own community and distrust ordinary people like me. Rightful, asked Holmes. Ferrari smiled. I treat all my employees correctly. Everyone has signed a contract and will be paid accordingly. That's the deal. If you need more information about Merrick and his entourage, you need to talk to his kin. That's what we're going to do, Holmes said. Forgive us for interrupting your accounting. Good morning. We wanted to leave when Ferrari asked us, When will Merrick come back? He is a valuable showpiece. Holmes turned around and said, I don't think Mr. Merrick is coming back. He will not take up his position as the Elephant Man again. But we have a two-year contract, the director said indignantly. A contract? asked Holmes, returning to the table. Can I see this contract? Of course, Ferrari replied. He opened a drawer and looked around briefly, then pulled out a sheet of paper and handed it to Holmes. He flew over the text, folded the paper in the middle and tore it in half. Mr. Merrick quits, he calmly declared as he dropped the pieces of paper to the ground. Then we left the wagon of the circus director, who apparently was all out of words. As we walked away and walked back towards the freak's wagons, I immediately said, Did you see that, Holmes? When we entered the room, Ferrari put his pencil aside from his left hand. Don't worry, my dear Watson, my friend replied calmly. Of course, I don't miss a thing like that. I stopped and said triumphantly, Well then, he did it. He is the perpetrator. He's left-handed and he has the physical force to knock down a man. Well, true, Holmes replied, and Signor Ferrari would certainly have the necessary ruthlessness for such an act. I saw that Holmes was still shaking his head, and I knew that my conclusions were premature. But it wasn't him, right? I asked softly. Holmes stopped briefly and turned to me. Two things speak against it he explained, with his right index finger raised. First, Mr. Merrick would probably have noticed the Italian accent. Secondly, there is no motive. Ferrari makes a lot of money with the circus. Why would he give up his profitable human capital for just fifty pounds? I got back on our path and caught up with Holmes within five steps. You are right, I confirmed. That makes no sense, at least for now. But we should still keep this shady guy on our list of suspects. Holmes smiled. 
We have to deal with this case intellectually, not emotionally, he said. There is little to no evidence. That is why we have to work meticulously in collecting, analysing and evaluating any lead. But don't let that take away your enthusiasm, Watson. I demonstratively put on an optimistic smile and clapped my hands. All right, I said. Whose statement do we want to evaluate intellectually as the next? We are going to see the little ones, Holmes said, though they don't really fit our profile. However, since they were Mr. Merrick's closest friends, after I am hoping that they are able to help us depict an image of the general circumstances in this family. With the help of the Chinese snake man, who was actually a contortionist rather than a human mutation, we quickly found the caravan of Bertram Dooley and Harry Bramley, where the two sat at a table and drank tea. From a distance, it seemed as if two children had come together with their toy tea service, but the faces of the two turned out to be very grown up. They were, in fact, simply small grown people, albeit with disproportionately large heads. Call me Bertie, one declared after we had introduced ourselves and set out the purpose of our presence. And me, Harry, added the other. Your visit brings a lot of joy to us, Bertie continued. We now have the certainty that Joseph is doing well. We didn't even know what happened to him. And on the other hand, I am glad to hear that real detectives are working to investigate the robbery. Normally, ordinary people don't really care about the problems of the freaks. Well, we do. I immediately confirmed. When it comes to justice, no obstacle is too... I interrupted myself before I could pronounce the word small. Harry laughed. Don't worry, Dr. Watson, he giggled. We know what we are. And then he picked up two more cups and poured us some tea. For the time being, we sat at the table and Holmes began the questioning. If my information is correct, he said, and then you're both friends with Mr. Merrick. Yes, Joseph is one of us, Bertie replied. He belongs to the community of freaks. We stick together, we help each other, and now it would be a pleasure for us if we could help you to clarify the case. However, Harry added, as he also sat down at the table, we have not heard anything about the incident in Brussels, and unfortunately we cannot say anything about it. We last saw Joseph shortly after the end of the performance, Back then he wanted to walk around the city a little bit. Well masked for understandable reasons. I understand, Holmes said, sipping on his tea. Well then, let us talk about the circus as a whole. We have already met the director, Mr. Ferrari. Not the most pleasant company, Harry said, but our employer. There are no real problems with him, as long as everyone knows where they belong. Mr. Ferrari was watching us closely when we packed to leave for Bruges. There is no way he could have left and gone into the city in between. Well, that gives him an alibi, I remarked with some regret, but he could have hired someone. However, it is unquestionable, Holmes immediately explained, that the perpetrator knew Mr. Merrick. It is highly likely that he is part of the carny. Who was Mr. Merrick in regular contact with? With all of us, Bertie replied. After all, we freaks are almost a family. Holmes thought briefly and looked around again. He said, As far as I can see, most family members have significant physical limitations or even disabilities. They would hardly have been able to knock Mr. Merrick down. But what about the other employees like the artists, clowns and such? Were there any conflicts there? Bertie and Harry looked at each other with a knowing look. The latter sighed and began to say, You must know, gentlemen, well, I think you probably already know, Joseph is a very good-natured person, too good-natured. He was also trusting with the outsiders, although we have often warned him not to look at the normals. They do not belong to us, and we do not belong to them. Joseph did not understand this in his boundless, sometimes somewhat infantile naivety, and in his desire to belong. As a result, mischief was occasionally done to him, and he was a willing victim. He let them make fun of him, expose and humiliate him, and he always dismissed this as fun among friends. But it wasn't. 
Uh, that means, I interjected, some of the normals made fun of Mr. Merrick without him noticing or wanting to notice. Exactly, Dr. Watson, Bertie confirmed. It was an unworthy spectacle. Are you willing to be a little more precise? asked Holmes, who immediately noticed that the two little ones were hesitant. So he added, Don't worry, I am not going to reveal that the information comes from any of the two of you. Finally, Harry replied, The ringleader of the fun makers is the German giant. The German giant? Holmes repeated with a questioning glance. Yes, Bertie said. His name is Hans. He's probably almost seven feet tall and a real beefcake. He lifts weights and all sorts of objects to demonstrate his otherworldly strength, with both hands at the same time. Holmes and I, of course, immediately realised that the man in question would have been able to assault Mr. Merrick with one punch, even with his left fist. And this giant kept harassing Mr. Merrick? asked Holmes. All of us, Harry replied. Hans despises us, but mostly Joseph. He was his main target. Holmes raised an eyebrow and said, There's probably a reason for this, apart from Mr. Merrick's good-naturedness. Bertie nodded. Indeed, he quickly replied. Joseph often talked to Miss Daisy. She's an acrobat, a trapeze artist. A young girl, very talented and beautiful. She is always very kind to us, and she was particularly pleased with the exchange of views with Joseph. Hans was annoyed. He thought that their relationship was unnatural and disgusting. At first he joked about it in a shameless way, uh, then he tried to intimidate Joseph. Did you hear that, Watson? shouted Holmes. It seems to me that we should talk to this German giant, don't we? Do that, Harry said. But be careful. Hans is easily irritable, aggressive, and besides... He is a monster. Bertie and Harry wished us well, and we promised to do everything we could to resolve the case. In their last words they said, Please let Joseph know that we hope for his speedy recovery, and that we never have to see him here in the circus again. He deserves better. And then we went to see Hans, whose accommodation was, of course, outside the freaks' department. Due to his outer appearance, it was rather easy for us to find Hans. He trained in front of his car with comparatively light weights. Despite the cool temperatures, he was only dressed in shorts with his muscular torso topless. At the top of his nearly seven-foot-tall muscular body sat a rather small, bald head, which was only adorned by a black moustache. Overall, an imposing, frightening appearance although he may have had his best years. Mr. Hans, exclaimed Holmes as we approached. The addressee put the weights aside and replied, Hans, just Hans. And you are? My name is Sherlock Holmes, replied my friend, who in vain stretched out his hand to greet the giant. And this is Dr. John Watson. We are investigating the violent robbery of Joseph Merrick. And who might that be? asked Hans with a dull face. Apparently he didn't even know the name of the preferred victim of his mockery. He is a former colleague of yours, I said. He suffers from a bone deformation that leads to disfigurements all over the body. Hans laughed. Oh, you are talking about the elephant man. I haven't seen him for a long time. He just disappeared in Belgium. However, I did not miss him very much. You say he was assaulted? Indeed, Holmes replied. He was beaten from behind in Brussels, robbed and left in the gutter. He is now in London Hospital. And now you come to me, the giant suspected, to ask me if I committed this act, right? Holmes smiled. Well, if you prefer the direct way, yes. Did you rob Mr. Merrick in the streets of Brussels? Once again, Hans let his grim, deep laughter be heard. And then he said calmly, Believe me, gentlemen, when I crush the elephant man, he does not stand up. Even the monstrous skull of this abomination I could crush with one hand. He truly deserves what he had coming for him.
What do you mean by that? asked Holmes. You don't seem to speak well of Mr. Merrick. Hans shook his little head. It is nothing personal, he said. These creatures aren't like us. They're not humans. Uh, they do not belong to us. Uh, they should be locked away. Who knows what is going on inside them? They may also carry contagious diseases. I'd rather have nothing to do with them. Unfortunately, I couldn't keep my resulting realization for myself. Oh, you're afraid of the freaks. It bubbled out of me involuntarily. The giant slapped his fist on the table on which he had previously placed his dumbbells, so that the floor below shook. I am not afraid of anything and no one. He cried and fixed me with a threatening gaze. But yes, I replied more blindfold and fearless, you just said. I couldn't get any further because Hans was already trampling towards with heavy steps, both fists clenched. Immediately I backed away a little bit. Holmes reacted quickly and stood in the way. Stay calm, gentlemen. We want to remain objective and stay focused. Dr. Watson certainly didn't want to offend you, Hans. He stopped, at least, but said, but it sounded like he did. Holmes looked at me in a prompt way, and I responded to his wish. That was a misunderstanding, I claimed to Hans. Forgive me if I offended you. Well? The giant snorted after a short pause. Is there anything else? I'd still have a question if you allowed, Holmes replied. We were told Mr. Merrick had a relationship with Miss Daisy. Do you know anything about it? Hans shook his whole body. Don't remind me of it, he said, but I wouldn't call it a relationship. They spent a lot of time together, talked a lot, but that was it. A Miss Daisy absurdity thought that this miscarriage had more in mind than some normal people. You don't think so? said Holmes. Only as a healthy body does a healthy mind live, Hans replied. We must not give in to these monsters. They stain us. Any friendship, and Miss Daisy probably wanted to build one, is against nature's course. Kind of disgusting. And I think you also said that to Miss Daisy, Holmes added. Of course, the giant replied. But she didn't want to hear any of it. She laughed at me. That's why you talked to Mr. Merrick, Holmes said. Yes, Hans freely confirmed. I told him to stay away from Miss Daisy. I suppose, Holmes continued, you've given a little emphasis to this well-intentioned advice? The giant innocently raised his paw-like hands. Well, I told him he could listen to me or deal with the consequences. The easy or the hard way, you know. I may have had some fun with the elephant man. Nothing serious, but then he disappeared anyways. That's all I can say. With these words, Hans took his dumbbells again to continue his training. We said goodbye politely with the German giant having only a disparaging growl and a dark look left for me. As we headed for Miss Daisy, whom we wanted to interview next, I briefly recapitulated the state of affairs. This rough and big guy might have been a good candidate, I said. In this case, we wouldn't have to search for a motive for long. It's conceivable, Holmes said. But why? I continued. Didn't you ask him about his location at the time of the crime? Holmes smiled and replied, Believe me, Watson, this Germanic gentleman probably subjugates a certain part of the circus staff. If he needs an alibi, he gets one. So we keep him on the list, I noted. And a joint plot by Ferrari and Hans is still in the running. And then we would only have to find the weak point of the German-Italian axis. My dear Watson, Holmes replied, it seems to me that your imagination is running wild. We are not writing a subpar crime novel here, but are investigating a real crime. Wilkie Collins and Emile Gaboriau may undoubtedly expect a lot of usually grotesque things from their readers, but unlike fiction, we have to stick to the facts and foremost reality.' 
and the fact is that your plot would be a big effort for a low result. Of course, Holmes wasn't wrong, so I focused again on the upcoming questioning of the trapeze artist. We found Miss Daisy in the large practice tent, where the aerial acrobats rehearsed her artistic feats. However, she did not swing through the heights of the platforms, ropes and poles, but had remained on the ground, juggling four balls. Miss Daisy, asked Holmes after we entered the tent. The young lady dropped the balls to the ground, and I rushed to help her collect them. An elderly gentleman, apparently overseeing Daisy's exercises, looked sharply at Holmes and grumbled. Who wants to know? Sherlock Holmes, consulting detective, my friend immediately introduced himself. We are investigating a robbery, he said. Daisy listened and seemed unsettled. A robbery? What happened? she asked. By now I had collected all the balls and handed them over to the young lady. The case concerns an acquaintance of yours, I explained. Mr. Joseph Merrick? Poor Joseph, cried Daisy. He's fine, isn't he? He is recovering and is in medical treatment, I replied. You don't have to worry. The girl, probably only sixteen years old, seemed honestly relieved. It's nice that nothing serious happened to him. He has it hard enough. Enough of it, her trainer ordered, who then turned to us. Daisy has a soft heart. She cares too much about the well-being of the freaks. I have told her often enough that they are not our business. Well, it is ours, Holmes replied with certainty. If you allow, we would have a few questions for Miss Daisy. I don't allow it, the man quipped. Holmes seemed surprised, saying, How insolent! Keeping her from talking to us outweighs your competences as a trainer. No, the man replied. Daisy is my daughter and still a minor. I understand, Holmes said. Unfortunately, I wasn't aware of that fact. Excuse me, Mr. Norman, added Daisy's father. My name is Tom Norman. I was certain that I have heard that name before, and Holmes' eyes flashed briefly. Then he nodded to Mr. Norman and repeated, Excuse me, Mr. Norman, would you, perhaps, answer us a few questions? Norman sighed and muttered, If I have to. Thank you, Holmes said quickly, to get directly to the point. As far as we know, your daughter had a friendly relationship with Mr. Merrick. Yes, shouted Mr. Norman, with an appeasing gesture, but that is none of your business. I think it is, Holmes countered. After all, we're investigating a serious crime. Ridiculous, Mr. Norman growled. OK, Daisy and Merrick have met from time to time, and I cannot rule out the possibility that the monster fell in love with my daughter, if it is able to feel that way. Presumably, they were more of animalistic nature. So you did not approve of their friendship? asked Holmes. Of course not, shouted Mr. Norman, like any caring father would. These freaks are not a treat for a young lady. Daisy is too young and too inexperienced to deal with these people. They are sneaky, vicious, criminal. But that's not true, father, shouted Daisy sheepishly. Shut up when I speak, ordered Mr. Norman, and turned to Holmes again. You see, these abominations have already messed with her head. Perhaps bewitched her. She now talks about tolerance and compassion. Well, I interjected, this is quite consistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ, don't you think? No, Mr. Norman replied. This is a sin. God has punished these monsters and turned them into lepers. We must follow this order and protect our children, whatever it takes. But you have nothing to do with the punishment and suspension of Mr. Merrick in Brussels? said Holmes, asking, perhaps as an instrument of God? Of course not, Mr. Norman replied indignantly, and you shouldn't talk so bluntly about the Lord. Unlike you, God loves all his children, said Daisy, who suddenly lost her shyness. You had no right to forbid me from meeting with Joseph. Silence, Mr. Norman ordered his daughter. These creatures come from hell, and that is where they are going back to.
or they should leave us alone. It would have been better for Mr. Merrick to listen to my advice and not to return back to London. Holmes and I looked at each other immediately, because we hadn't revealed that information. Only the perpetrator would know what Merrick had heard after the raid. Daisy began to cry. You're the monster, she sobbed. Mr. Norman finally lost his temper, stormed towards his daughter and raised his left hand to give her a slap. Quick-minded, I stopped him by grasping his wrist with strong pressure. I see you're left-handed, sir, I said, smiling. Like the perpetrator who assaulted Merrick, Holmes added, and only the perpetrator would know what he said to Mr. Merrick after he overpowered him, that he shouldn't go back to London. Daisy immediately took over the situation. You did what? she cried. You are responsible for the attack on Joseph? It was only for your best. Mr. Norman tried to justify himself. He should have left you alone. Then Mr. Norman understood how hopeless the situation was, which is why he made one last desperate attempt. With a quick turn of his arm, he escaped my grip, struck me in the chest and ran away, straight through the only exit of the tent. Due to the surprise of the attack, we probably wouldn't have caught up with him any time soon. But within seconds we heard Mr. Norman outside screaming, Help! Let go of me! Away from me, you cursed abominations! Holmes and I rushed out, where Mr. Norman had apparently been confronted by Harry and Bertie. They were holding him on his left arm, and Hans skillfully turned his right arm on his back, making it impossible for Mr. Norman to escape again. We thought, Mr. Holmes, you might need help, Bertie quipped. And Hans, who, contrary to expectations, was actually helping the two little ones, added, No one should hurt Miss Daisy. Neither freak nor human. Tom Norman made a full confession to Scotland Yard. He had stalked and assaulted Joseph Merrick in Brussels to teach him a lesson, as he called it. He had taken the fifty pounds to make it look like an ordinary robbery, which almost worked out had he remained silent. Mr. Norman, however, not only had an issue with Mr. Merrick's friendly relationship to his daughter, but they were going back to Mr. Merrick's time in Whitechapel Road 123, and that was why I oddly remembered his name. He had been Mr. Merrick's first London exhibitor on Whitechapel Road in 1884. After the doctors of the neighbouring London hospital became aware of the elephant man and the first examination by Dr. Treves took place, Norman's establishment was closed by the authorities. He blamed Mr. Merrick wrongly for this, of course. Although the actual offence had been committed in the Kingdom of Belgium, the judicial authorities in London and Brussels agreed that Mr. Norman would be tried in an English court. He was eventually sentenced to two years in prison and financial reparations to Mr. Merrick. He was admitted as a permanent patient at London Hospital where Daisy Norman, accompanied by Holmes and my humble self, visited Mr. Merrick on the evening of her father's arrest. And that wasn't the only time Miss Daisy would visit Mr. Merrick. The permanent admission also allowed Mr. Merrick to live at least a safe and dignified life with the best medical care. However, the cost of this was not inconsiderable. It goes without saying that our investigative fee went into funding this as well. In the end, however, a fundraising campaign by the Times ensured that treatment, accommodation and food were provided in the hospital in the long term. My colleague, Dr. Treves, took full care of his patient, although it turned out that he could not be helped sustainably. Eventually, the two became good friends. Addendum
April 11, 1890. I had just learned via my colleague, Dr. Frederick Treves, that Joseph Merrick died today at the age of just 27. He was found lying on his back in his bed in a position that inevitably led to his death. It is unclear whether it was an accident or a suicide. But I hope in any case that the disabled young man, who, as an elephant man, has had questionable success, would now be given the peace and quiet that was not given to him in life.